Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the OpenFS Core Implementations Week in Sync for Monday, the 12th of October 2020. Uh, I am Aiken Brain, I will be your host. We're going to go through our high priority initiatives, our other initiatives, and then questions, parking, QA, all that good stuff. Um, so, to kick us off, uh, we're going to talk about upcoming ship releases. So, what is upcoming and what has shipped? Uh, go PFS, RAR8 still underway, no RC, no RC quite yet, uh, heading services things and such to be coming in the next thing we talk about. Incredible. There's, um, there's going to be a JSI PFS release. I'm now like working full time on trying to get Heracles uh, TypeScript stuff over the line with him. Um, and as soon as that's in, we will ship a release which will include the deprecation, you no, know, the removal of SecIO uh, as well. Um, so that should hopefully be up this week. Next up on the list uh, is pinning services. We can talk about that. Yes. Uh, so uh, Sharnas tests are fun, um, but no, not, not really. Um, getting Sharnas tests to running containers that you can have other Docker containers talk to them because Circle doesn't let you run Docker containers in the primary uh, or let you attach to remote services from the primary container is also fun. Uh, so Pitar is, is working through that. Um, we're going we're to get this squared away this week one way or another. Like. Uh, spending this much time on just trying to get the automated testing running for the pinning service stuff is is just uh, is too taxing. We got we got other stuff to do. Um, uh, we had a meeting to discuss uh, local and remote uh, pinning like CLI and HTTP API. Uh, I put a link in which has sort of my summary of where I think our conclude where our, our conclusions were. Um, it was, uh, Jacob and Lytle have already commented, which is very helpful. I still have to respond to all of their, to their very helpful comments. Uh, if you are interested in what this, what these new pin API things should look like and how we're going to try and shove towards convergence between the, the remote and local APIs, uh, please take a look. Um, Alex, your, your, uh, input would also would be appreciated because JS may want to do something similar. Um, this will also set up set us up for uh, success when uh, Andrew starts working on uh, doing the local pinning in the data store in Go IPFS and how to make this all work easier. And that is pinning services. Uh, Sekio removal is next. I guess uh, I can take that too. Uh, Jacob, blog post is coming out tomorrow, right? Yeah, I need to finish writing that and get the thumbs up for people. So maybe early Wednesday, but yeah, definitely trying trying for tomorrow. And once that's out, we will then uh, fire a, a shot across the bow by just like turning off Sekio on the Bootstrap nodes and seeing if anybody has not been reading their their, you know, uh, GitHub, Twitter, discuss anywhere we've been yelling at them about SecIO removal. Uh, and then we'll get lots of floods being like, hey, my node stopped working, at which point we will then say, hi, your node is like, you know, over a year old. Please update. There's a good reason. We swear. Um, here's a blog post that says why we're doing it. Um, and then after like a day or two of leaving it like this, we'll turn it we'll turn it back on for uh, for a little while to help those guys, you know, be able to do a, a slower update. Um, I guess related to SecIO removal, uh, Andrew Nesbitt uh, is going to be do is doing some uh, analysis on the DHT as to who is running these old nodes so that we can maybe communicate with them and help figure out help them figure out how we can help them upgrade and that is on that is ongoing which has the benefit of us making better DHT crawling stuff 
I like it. Maybe we can ship them a Raspberry Pi or something. Stop using this old software. Uh, next up is the Rust Type Reverse Initiative. I don't see um, anything from the Rust team. Um, I think we were going to take that off the list because there will be no updates in the foreseeable future. Okay, that sounds sensible. Uh, next up is JSON Proof Discoverability and Connectivity. Uh, yeah, so the the PR that I had opened last week uh, got merged. It basically now we can find the remote relays uh, on the network using uh, contact routing, uh, and uh, this is merged in the 0 0.30 branch for the upcoming release. And for finishing the auto relay stuff, uh, I will work this week on a custom announced filter function and also a sorter in order to allow us to order the dials, for example, we want to go first for the public addresses and try them before going to the private ones. And I'll be working on that this week. Hopefully I'll finish it because in the next week I will be out. And yeah, that's it. Sweet. That uh, brings us to the end of the high priority initiatives. Uh, moving on to the other initiatives. Uh, first up is improving web UI file out. Uh, yeah, so uh, I don't have a list on the notes yet, but uh, there's a whole stack of uh, pull requests I need to get in. Um, I got some reviews from Alex, I need to still follow up. I, I think some of the patches need upgrading because uh, things have landed and now they have merge conflicts. But other than everything was green uh, last Friday. So I think we'll have to re-merge hopefully soon. Um, uh, the next one is also mine, which is TypeScript integration. Um, so last week I updated all the, or I guess one pull request. Uh, uh, I got a, another review from Alex that I was just following up. So after this call, I'll submit the changes that were requested. So hopefully we can land it very soon. It's so close. It's so very close. It's going to be great. Uh, uh, by the way, Alex, if you'll have a couple of minutes after the call, it would be really helped to sync up on some of the things that I, were not clear to me. Yeah, no problem. Uh, next up, bringing MP and IPFS up to date. Uh, there is no update here on that. Uh, Badger 2 support. All right, uh, so all of the work for the actual support on our side is done other than making sure that we've updated dependencies to what we decided to go out with. And the couple of fixes that we require from Badger um, have not been put into an actual release yet. So we need to decide if we want to wait on a release or we want to go out with a, a specific commit. And they may, uh, they may have some additional breaking changes that we need to be aware of. So um, it's basically need to, um, decide what we, uh, what and when we want to go out with uh, a particular Badger version. Otherwise, um, we're good. Another thing that got brought into the Badger 2 changes was support for batching so that we are no longer constrained to the limits of a single transaction for um, a high volume uh, writes. And that's something that we'll get along with this, this update. It's not specifically related to Badger 2 support, but it'll, it will come along um, and for both Badger and Badger 2. Awesome. Uh, DNS adder resolving in JS is the next thing. Yeah, so Michael is trying to do nice things for infra and JS makes that harder to do because uh, we don't have DNS adder resolution. Um, and then that chain of events uh, kind of sucks. So normally our text records include the IP address so if you recursively look up the DNS addresses, you will get the IP address of the node. That is a problem for WebSockets and WebRTC star because we have to keep the DNS name. Um, so we need to fix that, that slew of records. Um, so the DNS adder records that Michael's working on should eventually have the quick, or I think they already have the quick IP addresses in now. And then it will eventually have the WebSockets WebSocket secure addresses, the DNS addresses in. Um, so we're working on adding those. And then Boschko is working on the actual resolvers um, so that we can make sure that we 
can dynamically just point at bootstrap libbdb io um, and get the bootstrap addresses instead of hard coding those guys in there. So it is a process, but it is happening this week, thanks to all the work for Vashko and Michael on that. Uh, that's it for the other initiatives. Uh, so the design review proposals, anybody want to put their idea in the stocks and have moldy vegetables thrown at it? I mean, I, it's not as bad as that. But... Okay, blockers and asks. Questions. I've got a question. Who controls the number of Travis runners that we have? Anyone know? Because I've spent the CI gods. Exactly. Who, who do I have to sacrifice a goat to? I don't want to sacrifice it to the wrong god. That would be a disaster. And that would fewer workers. That'd be terrible. Um, I spent ages yeah. making CI faster, right? Right now, the longest job takes 15 minutes and everything is run in parallel. Um, so like the whole build would take 15 minutes if we could run them all in parallel at the same time, which we need more runners for. Which is bonkers when you consider like it wasn't too long ago that JSI Professor build took two hours. Uh, now it takes 15 minutes. Um, but it needs more runners in order to parallelize it like that. Don't you laugh at Dean? This is testing Go as well. Like it's running the HTTP client against Go. So we know when you break us through through the, the HTTP client. <laughs> uh, I did, yeah, that's that's a long time. Yeah. yeah. Mike, is that you? Um Infrabot? This is Michael. Um, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, I was just going to ask, how many in parallel would you need? I mean, loads. Like, how many do you want to run? Like, because obviously, if, if someone runs a PR, then it's running loads of jobs as well. Yeah, I'm just wondering, like, um, if we could get a because so we're we're having a long discussion in IPLD that's that's not going to wrap up anytime soon, but basically moving everything to actions. Um, and trying to standardize a lot more of the build and test infrastructure, particularly on the Go side. Um, and that's like a long-term thing, um, but this could be something that we looked at, but it would be in action. So I really wanted to kind of understand how many in parallel do we need? Because there are limits on what we get for free there, but I think that we can just give them some money and then we'll get more. Hmm. So we just spent ages getting Travis working and it's almost working. And the only thing that's not working is it needs a few more runners. So I'd rather just increase the number of runners than rewrite the whole. No, no, I, I know. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's definitely what you should do now. I'm just saying, in the future, like I, I want to understand how many that you need, so that when we refactor this, we have that in mind as one of the requirements. When it's a Thursday, and I'm like, my week hasn't been painful enough. Then I'll <laughs> much up for now. Uh, sorry, Burns, you were saying something. Burns. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I can take a look at this. It might be Andy who has permission, but I can pull that thread uh, and I'll give you all of the runners I can. Amazing. I will, I will hook up offline. That'd be great. Um, any other questions? Is there a question for Michael while he's here? Does IPLD have any binaries? Does, Go, does the Go IPLD team have any binaries that they run in CI? That is a good question that I don't quite know the answer to, um, and it may change shortly. Um, but I would ask uh, Daniel and Eric about that. And yeah. if there's any particular reason why you're asking, I would surface that as well so that they can make sure that, that that ends up in the things that they're doing. It's actually on Daniel's plate, I think, one of his, one of his things this quarter to work on this. So. The, the reason I was asking is, most, is mostly because uh... Our circle CI orb doesn't really play nicely with binaries that are not Go IPFS. Um, libraries are all fine, but because of like magic shenanigans around plugins, it's like not really, it's causing some issues with non Go IPFS binaries. And hmm. while I could, while we could go fix that and go with like, go through all of the sort of all, all of the bash script hacks required. Uh, if there was already an action that I could just deploy for existing Go IP for existing Go binaries, that would just be easier. 
Oh yeah, no, that's that's happening. Like, um, I mean, the the current GitHub action for running Go programs that is just like in the marketplace, Daniel wrote, and he is like, he actually has, he's in the loop with a couple of people at GitHub who work on actions to like resolve any of his Go related problems. Um, so you know, when, whatever we end up with at the end of this will will be uh, that simple and integrated, I imagine. Okay, cool. This context there was we're building a crawler. The crawler is a binary. Want to make sure the binary builds and you know does things. Oh, are you going to run the crawler in actions? No, I think that would be overkill. I mean, that would be cool, but I think that would also be overkill. It's really easy and fun <laughs> to run cron job actions. <laughs> GitHub just like pays for you to run cloud cron jobs. It's amazing. <laughs> Cool. Uh, any other questions? Nope. Let me move on to the parking lot. Uh, I see there's a thing in here about IPLD. Uh, I'm not doing OKRs anymore. Yeah, I mean, not. the sort of OKR light thing. Um, so we took the opportunity to kind of think about like what would be a better fit in general for just how we work um, and surfacing what we do and all of that. So um, a lot of, like the OKR process kind of has like two sides to it. One is that it's how we communicate with the rest of the org and, and outside about a bunch of things that are happening. And then it's also kind of how we do planning. And it's never really been how IPLD does planning. We, we tend to be a little bit more nimble than an OKR process. We we will shift priorities like every week if we need to, if, if a lot of things are coming in that are high priority. Um, so things just move around a little bit more and we, we like to keep it a little bit more fluid. Um, so yeah, what, what we did instead was we came up with a theme for the quarter, which is um, protocols over projects. And we're trying to focus more on the protocol side than we have in the past. Um, and so there's a write-up about that in the team management page, but there's also this really cool list now of everybody in our team and then every single high priority item that they have for the quarter so you know like what they're working on right now and if something comes up we will on that day that that gets bumped we will bump it we will say why it got bumped and we will say like now this person is working on this because it was a higher priority um and also um one thing that we decided to do kind of later in the cycle was we started putting all of the maintenance burden that each person has because we felt like that was really not being captured very well and it was not very well appreciated um so we started to sort of add um what what different projects people have maintainership of that we expect like, you know, not super frequent, but relatively frequent um, burden on their time as a result. So I don't know, um, now you have kind of a view of what we're doing that we update every week um, and you can go check that out on the team management repo um, in the readme. And yeah, if it's, if it's a format that people like, um, I would encourage you to try something similar if you want. People not processes and working software over comprehensive documentation. I have a manifesto you might like to read. So would would Q1 be a good time for us to talk about burning Go IPLD Cbor and Go Merkle DAG and Go IPLD format? Uh, burn, burn, burn. What do you mean by burn? <laughs> uh, find every hard drive that has it installed and wipe it. Uh, that then, that might be tricky, uh, you know, considering that didn't you just no. cycle out like a, an ITFS instance in the network from like 2017? Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, no, no, I, I think uh, like, look, we, as you know, um, the, the Go IPLD Prime stuff has reached like a, a new stage of maturity. We're doing the Hamped ADL stuff on it now. There's some Filecoin work that Will is doing that's going to give us schemas for most of the Filecoin data structures, and and so we're gonna we're gonna have like a a very new level of maturity around Go IPLD Prime like this quarter. And so if you the moment that you migrate to it, we can stop maintaining the old packages. Um, and and the same thing on the JavaScript side too. Actually, like we Gozala just finished up like his last round of of revisions, and I've just broken off a bunch of projects to use all the new primitives so that I'm testing them out and putting them through some paces before advocating that other people use them um but we're like really close on that side too to just having that that can just be swapped out now as well um and once you know ipfs isn't relying on the old 
APIs anymore, we're fine with deprecating them. Like we we already don't really like to touch them, um, but we, we do because they're dependent on. So yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that cycle is much more dependent on you than on us. Like we, our view is that we'll, we'll have to support it as long as you're using it. And if you stop using it, then that's the, the, the end of our support cycle as far as we're concerned. Um, I would love some help uh, migrating to the new APIs. I mean, that would be really useful. And it would also mean that you could stop supporting the old stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also, man, the, uh, the, the depth tree is just going to get way smaller for you. Way, way smaller. Um, I mean, the new DAG PB drops all of protobuf. Like, we don't actually pull in any of the protobuf depth tree anymore. Um, and actually, Rod is working on a new DAG seaboard that's native JS. So that'll do the same thing and drop all those native Bork libraries and everything. So, um, so yeah, there's going to be a huge number of improvements. I know that, like, Arakli has been thinking about that a lot more than I have. And he spent a lot more time in the IPFS code base as he's working through all of this. Um, and he needs a lot of these upgrades to happen as well for his stuff. So I think like just kind of the three of us should coordinate that and figure out like exactly what the strategy is there. Cause yeah, we don't, we don't mind pitching in at all, but, but also like our familiarity with that code base is a little low. Like every time I have to jump in there, I'm like, where are things? Um, and so that's always a challenge. Yeah, on, on the ghost side, like I, I'm happy once O.8 goes out to start looking a little bit in like what it would take to start moving to some of the newer GoIPLD libraries. But my most recent interaction with them was that it still required a little bit of knowing how things were working in order to optimally use them. Um, and if I could like hand over an interface, which was like, here is the traversal interface that's required. And here's what I need from like DAG PB, or or this is what I need from the Unix FS interfaces, and like mm. rip out all the internals with whatever you want. Like that would be, I think that would be a good way to also stress that the interfaces like are actually doing that the IPLD libraries are actually usable in the way they want them to be usable. Yeah, I mean, I think we're gonna have to really kind of dig into the specifics here. Because, I mean, one is that when you were using them, there's probably like no documentation either. So like by, by you have to really know how they work, you probably meant like you literally had to look through the code to figure out how to use them. Um, and, and like that is definitely changing um, because like just having another person on the team who's using that code and then like documenting it as they go and improving things. Um, and we have way more example libraries using them now as well. So like there's other code that you can look at that uses it. I think that though the, the way that the APIs and interfaces are structured is very different from the old system. And so there's, there's a degree to which like if you're, if you're porting over, if you're migrating over and you don't want to take on a sort of larger refactor that makes it more congruent with this new interface style, there, it may be actually really difficult to do that. And what we may want to look at is like, okay, is there some library that we sort of put in between that, that makes this a little bit easier? Is there some kind of utility library that we use or, um, is, is there like another refactor of some of this stuff that GoIPFS wants to do anyway? And so in that refactor, you would just make it more congruent with our library. Um, there's a lot of options that we can take and you're gonna have to kind of dig in through the code. I know at one point um, really early on, Peter and Eric had started to kind of go through this and just look at the depth tree and where all of the IPLD libraries are and how they interact and what you would kind of have to do to start to break them apart. Um, and I, that, that, that got to the point where like, oh, okay, we're ready to do something. And then all of the priorities shifted and none of this happened. So uh, we would need to like return to that. Um, but I mean, we're in a much better place to do that than we were before. Um, so that's really good news. And um, if you're not you know, talking about really doing this until Q1, it'll be much, much better even then um, because we're doing so much stuff right now um, with them. So. Okay. Yeah, that, that, cool. is, that is very helpful to know. Thanks. Cool. I think that brings us almost to time. Um, Thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, this has been the IPFS Core Implementations Weekly Sync for Monday, the 12th of October, 2020. Please fill in your async updates. Uh, some people do read them. Um, I haven't been doing it recently. I'm very naughty. I'm going to stop doing it again because it's bad, Alex, bad, Alex. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, be safe. Don't touch your face. There's still a pandemic happening. See you on the internet. Bye.